The Almond army had pushed the Dravian front line into the retreating back line and were pushing steadily towards the camp. Metallic ringing howls echoed across the dunes. They mixed with the screaming of the Dravian army still left on the field as they were crushed between the Almond army and the out-of-control summons. Wolf gave Lelander the signal and she moved the ragtag group forward in time with her. Wolf tried to remain calm, but his plan was already spinning out of control. Why didn't the priest tell him about the horny plan to use to signal the witches? Why were there still so many soldiers in the camp? He was glad to have the help, but why not tell him that the neophytes and the guards were coming? He watched the masked man scuttle into the shadows, towards the caravan, and Wolf thought he might have understood the man's motives. The battlefield had become an unforgiving arena where shield walls broke and reformed under the constant threat of monsters. Metallic howls announced the presence of the wolves as Dravian and Almond alike fell to the pony-sized, planar creatures. The unyielding sun cast down on the midday battlefield, scorching all who struggled upon it, man and monster. The wolves' native plain was one of endless sand and scorching suns. They preferred a hunt at noon, during the day's hottest hours. There was no telling how many of them ran through the battlefield, as more howls brought in more packs. They ransacked both camps, and the Dravian Reserve ended up protecting the witches as they fainted, their magic spent. Soldiers tried to form up wagons and start a new evacuation. Goldmask's caravan was long gone. The chain of command had been broken on the Dravian side, and the camp started to fall apart. The front line swayed as it began to be swallowed by a sea of almond. Zalman watched the chaos, curious. He was unsure if he had broken the Dravian army, or if the threat of their Ender's explosive end had. Maybe they had a falling out, Dravia was mainly independent tribes after all. He had watched the first caravan that had left, and he recognized the colors from his research. It was the capital forces. Perhaps they were headed there to reinforce it. Either way, he considered it a bad strategy. What was left of the Dravian forces here would be crushed. He would make sure of it. He also considered calling the Fauna into the fight a losing strategy. He was sure they were also running through his camp, but thought his men were a better fight for them with their medium and heavy armor. The summoned monsters had proved to be effective though, breaking down his men's shield walls with a sheer mass. He had to dispatch a few of them himself already. Solomon saw a group of chainmail clad men with metal skull caps on. The large pikes and halberds they wielded were an odd sight to see among the Dravian infantry. They had a group of rabble behind them, dressed in everything from chains to discarded almond armor. They wielded borrowed or stolen weapons. A group of Dravian mages followed in their midst, sometimes blending into them. Their bright colored clothes added to the chaos of the rabble. He couldn't help but say aloud, interesting, as a small smile spread across his lips. Marcus stood to the left of his king, his tower shield replaced at the same time his broken arm and ribs were fixed. He heard his king's utterance. He turned his helmed head in time to see the man smile, his eyes fixed on the front line. He followed Salmon's gaze, catching a glimpse of purple in the crowd. His heart stopped, and dread filled him. His fears were confirmed. He saw the lithe mage among a group of witches. He instinctively pulled the shield in front of himself, guarding his chest. Of all the entire Dravian force, he considered the Dravian mages the biggest threat. Even though he knew his king had their mages take precautions with their armor, even though one of those self-same mages sat behind Solomon, he looked towards the mage to confirm he was still there. A tall, skinny, older man, pale as the moon. He wore a dark black robe, the hood drawn up over his bald, pale head. He looked at Valerie next. She stood on the king's right. If she had noticed the Dravian mages, she didn't give any indication. Her solid frame still as a statue. Valerie heard Solomon. She didn't have to look at him to know he was smiling. She heard it in his voice. It didn't matter to her what the young king thought was interesting. It could have been any number of things. Her loyalty to Solomon was unwavering. She thought of him as a younger brother in need of tutelage, and she would defend him with her life if necessary. As she scanned the field with her eyes, ever watchful, her vision caught the large halberd and guards and chainmail. She saw what she thought were civilians behind them. Had the Dravians become so desperate? She didn't like the idea of killing untrained combatants, but if everything went to plan, she wouldn't have to. The Almond army ground forward, step by step, the shield wall moved, halting occasionally deal with pockets of resistance. The shield wall only broke under the onslaught of the summoned beast or the rare surprise attack of a sand wolf, dragging an armored soldier away into the desert. 
It had been a while since the last time she had seen one of the summoned creatures. Valerie guessed the exhaustion and the current state of the Gravian camp would make it hard to summon more. The shield wall stopped, now assaulted by a fresh wave of Dravian soldiers, perhaps inspired by the halberd wielding guards and civilians. The almond wall of flesh and still struck at them, as they baked under the noonday sun. Unusually long halberds and pikes struck back. The civilians huddled behind them, huddled around the brightly colored Gravian shamans. Valerie kept them in the corner of her eye as she scanned the battlefield, looking for immediate threats to her king. Wolf walked in the center of the Dravian wishes as they, ringed by the fanatics, approached the almond shield wall. The Dravian backline command must have gotten some of their men under control as they now charged alongside Wolf's tent guard. They crashed against the almonds and both forces ground to halt on the burning sands. The Niu fights milled about behind the guards, unsure what to do. The guards lashed out with their long weapons, exchanging blows with the almond line. Wolf, like most Dravians his age, was trained as a dervish, dual-wielding dancers of death. And while the fighting style worked against multiple opponents, it wasn't exactly effective against shield walls. He cursed his luck. If only they had been moments faster, they could have struck with the summoned beasts. He nervously pawned the scimitars on his hips as he looked around waiting for the next disaster to strike. He desperately wanted to protect the people around him, but his very own plan probably met their death. A shrill cry answered his paranoia as one of the zealots was dragged away by an alien feline creature. Its large gray frame sunk low to the ground as it clutched the neophyte in its toothy maw. It pulled him through the mass of soldiers, avoiding them with ease. Most unaware of it, the screaming man in his jaw is the only clue of its presence. Wolf knew there was nothing he could do for him as the sand wolf disappeared into the crowd. The witches still ringed him. He was hoping to save their magic for Solomon's guards, but things were becoming desperate. He hoped the witches back in camp could resume their summons soon, but he wasn't sure if he could wait for them. The guards in front of him swung their halberds and pikes. He watched one of the guards' halberds bounce off an almond soldier's helm and lodge behind the man's shield. The guard pulled, trying to free it, as an almond longspear struck him in the eye. Wolf saw his moment. He pushed forward through the neophytes as he screamed, To me! Push! He grabbed the halberd shaft of the soldier and the shield wall recovered from the smack on the head. He pulled, yanking the man forward as he dodged the lethal spear tips. The neophytes yelled incoherent battle cries as they rushed the wall. A soldier of the second almond line grabbed his companion in the front, desperately, in an attempt to force the shield wall closed. Wolf struggled against him in a tug of war as neophytes died in front of him, trying to reach the tiny gap. A high pitched whistle warbled by him and he thought his ears burst. He clutched him in pain as the soldier in the back line flew backward, struck by the sonic pulse. The lander pulled Wolf to his feet as the guards and neophytes streamed into the shield wall's crack. After she helped him up, he watched their progress for a minute while he recovered, then led the witches to join them. Valerie watched as the front and second lines were blown apart. The third line, men in reserve, pushed in to fill the gap. They were swarmed by the Dravian civilians, who seemed to have no concern for their safety. They fell, pierced by spear and sword as if they wished to see how many blows they could take. She, for a moment, panically looked towards Solomon to make sure he was still beside her. He hadn't moved, but she saw the motion in his posture, a tension like a cat about to pounce. The fourth line is the one they set in, with a line behind them. A fresh sixth line would be moving in soon. If she could manage to stop Solomon from doing anything reckless, they could win this without endangering him. She looked at him again. This time, the tension had left his body. Before she could question why, she saw the white gold armor of a royal guard headed towards the breach. She knew instantly it was Marcus, the oldest servant guard aside from her. She called out to him, Marcus, you fool, why are you breaking formation? He ignored her. She moved to pursue him, but Solomon raised a hand to stop her. He wanted another crack at the Dravian mage. Don't worry, I sent ours with him, Solomon said coldly, a tinge of jealousy perhaps coloring his voice. The lander stood facing a new wall, not unlike the last. A fresh line of soldiers poured at them. She was unsure what to do. The wishes behind her seemed to be following her lead and waited impatiently to see what she would do. Then he dashed past her. His bright red robe flashed as the scimitars in his hands whirled. Wolf headed towards an almond struggling with one of the guards. He broke his leg with a swift kick. With a precise cut between the soldier's gorget and helmet, he slit the man's throat as he danced past him. She raced after him, still unsure of what she should do. Then she saw it, what he ran towards, Solomon and his guard. 
she pointed at them and shouted as she looked back towards the witches who were following her. They seemed to get the hint, though she wasn't sure how. She spun back around, still running, and she spotted a white tuft of fur sticking out of the ground in front of her. She stopped instantly coming to rest on her tippy toes. Marcus, his shield drawn and cover, peeked over the top of it as he approached the young mage, mage drawn. She had yet to see him as she ran at him. Her head turned towards more of those accursed witches as she shouted something incomprehensible. She turned back around and ground to a halt. He at first thought it was because she had finally noticed him, but he followed her gaze to the sand. There amidst the fine particles was a light gray, thin fibrous material that looked to him like a poorly made, ugly carpet. Her wariness of it made him wary of it, so he moved to step around it. She finally noticed him, her eyes following as he moved around the ugly, sand-filled rug. She stood there. Out of the corner of his eye, he thought he saw movement. The gray mat moved slowly, and Marcus stopped. He had yet to see one up close, but he suddenly recalled seeing what looked like shaggy, light gray fur on the top of the backs of the creatures known as sand wolves. He looked back at the young Dravian. Once again, their eyes met over the back of the beast. Something of him was reflected there. Frustration urgency. He anchored his shield into the ground with a loud thud, and he pulled himself behind it, expecting the worst. It came. It hit the shield hard, but it didn't bowl him over. Instead, it flipped over the top of the large tower shield, landing on its shoulder. It sprang off its back legs with a snarl. Its front paws opened wide for an embrace, its dagger-like claws outstretched. Pivoting, Marcus slammed into it with his shield. It bounced off with a dull thud. It came back instantly, unfazed, screeching a horrendous sound no animal should make. It swung out batting the shield like a cat would a mouse. He dropped the shield again, sinking it into the sand. He put his weight behind it to weather the heavy hits. It gripped the shield in its terrible paws and pulled. It yanked him and the shield out of the sand. They went through an awkward few moments as the sand wolf yanked him off the ground and forward. Then again, he struggled to keep hold of the shield, holding on with both hands now, his mace abandoned. It gave up on pulling the shield away from him, and now, instead, it shook it violently, thrashing left and right. Marcus prayed his grip would hold. Two large canine fangs landed in front of his face as it bit the top of the tower shield, pushing it down. The thing's nose set directly in front of his as he looked up into its eyes. It breathed a deep breath out through its mouth, and Marcus's nose was assaulted by the smell of rotten, fetid meat. Its eyes were malicious filled orbs of bright yellow. A slit pupil ran down the middle. Four dots surrounded it. He felt like each dot was a new pupil, an eye within an eye, each looking for a way to spill his blood. A deep, almost inaudible growl echoed from his dark gray throat, and Marcus felt his heart threaten to stop. He knew the thing had the tower shield now, so he unclipped it from his arm and rolled backward. He drew a large paring dagger, the last weapon at his disposal, as he came to his feet. The creature drew the shield in, and it reminded Marcus of a large, naked gray house cat as it racked and bit the shield. Its yellow eyes focused on him, and it tossed the shield like a ball. It bounced like one across the sand, too, coming to rest twenty or so feet beside the creature. It bounded back up onto its feet, its long, lipless mouth exposing a row of sharp, saw-like teeth that ran down its long maw that was tipped with four overly large canines and a fleshy black nose. His front legs crouched low, its narrow whip of a tail wriggled like a snake. He pulled the dagger in front of himself, knowing he had no shot if he ran. It pounced, its front legs once again outstretched as if to embrace him, its hind lifted as though it meant to tear the air. Its mouth opened wide, exposing its whole length, dripping with a thick, mucous saliva. Melander watched Solomon's guard fight for his life. She was torn. No one deserved the fate of being eaten alive or worse, stuffed into a sand wolf cache. To slowly die from its poisonous bite or dehydration while the wolf waits for you to ripen. She looked towards Wolf. He fought beside a pair of guards, who had dropped their long weapons in favor of scavenged almond short swords. She looked to the witches behind her. Some ran past her, towards the man in the red mystic's robes. She frantically called out for them to help Wolf. Solomon watched Marcus head towards the Dravians with the fourth line. The armored Dravians clashed with them in melee, unable to form a shield wall. Marcus slipped through them and towards the mages with surprising ease. Solomon wondered where the mage he sent with Marcus was, but he didn't see the strange, lengthy man. Then his attention was drawn to a red-veiled mage fighting with the Dravian soldiers. 
He watched the mage dispatch his men in a red flowing dance, and he couldn't help but wonder if some kind of magic was at work. He tried to look for Marcus again, but he had disappeared in the turning crowd of soldiers. Solomon wished him luck as he pushed forward, towards the mage. Valerie caught his arm after a step and said, Is this a wise idea, my lord? He tapped her arm reassuringly, then he drew his sword, pointed it at the mage and said, If I don't stop that one, many more will die. My lord, with all due respect, isn't that war? Men dying for their king? She replied, letting go of his arm. True, but it's my job to protect them from threats like these, he said. Then with a smile and a wink, he said, Besides, it will be fun. Valerie groaned. This is what she had feared. Solomon laughed, knowing all too well her thoughts. He lifted the drawn sword and commanded his royal guard forward. Phineas was a wizard. He had lived in Alma for most of his life and had seen the crown pass to three different kings now. It suited him fine since he had largely been ignored for most of his time in the country. He had spent the vast majority of his life probing the dark secrets of magic in quiet solitude and that was how he liked it. He thought himself immune to the wiles and wills of kings and nobility alike, but now found himself on a battlefield, on the order of a king himself. Marcus Valoris, second in command of the Royal Guard, had expressed certain fears, and Phineas was the only one left of the Almond Wizards who hadn't been exhausted after enchanting the guard's armor against magic. Therefore, he was the one unwillingly volunteered. Therefore, he was the one unwillingly volunteered. Now he had received yet another order to escort Marcus on his trip to combat the enemy mages. For the first time, it occurred to him that he might have to abandon Alma, his research, and everything he had built over the last 80 years, just to live. He had turned himself invisible shortly after Solomon had ordered him to protect Marcus, but only step in if you have to. There were some stipulations to the spell. It didn't mask his sounds, smells, or physical traces, like footprints in the sand. Touching another living creature or casting another spell would break it as well. He had started following Marcus at a ten-foot pace, careful not to run into any of the soldiers running around him, but now the distance had grown considerably between them. Phineas growled to himself as he watched Marcus simply slide between the Dravian soldiers. It was like the group hadn't seen him at all or didn't care about one more soldier heading to the front line when the Almond King was right there, in front of them. He tried to figure out a way through the fighting Dravians, a way to follow Marcus, Again, he thought of abandoning the guard to whatever fate had in store, abandoning Alma. It would be like abandoning his life, but at least he would be alive. Wolf blocked a blow and struck back while he kept an eye on the Almond Royal Guard's slow, methodical advance. Another line of Almond soldiers rushed in front of them, meeting him and the guards in waves. His guards fell around him, unable to hold off the crushing tide. He found himself surrounded. Only four of the guards remained forced to his side by a closing wall of swords. Ghosts floated around him, laughing. Memories not his own swirled on the cusp of his mind as he pushed them away. His skin burned as he tried to rein himself under control. A rhythm like a heartbeat stuck in his ears as he felt the chains pushing him to free them, to free himself. A bright flash of light blinded him. He was unsure if it was real. A boom followed the flash, and the rhythm was knocked from his head. Flashes of bright colors, chaos, and a cacophony of magic were leveled upon the soldiers surrounding him. After the ringing in his ears was gone, a new noise greeted him, the singing and screaming of gravity and witches. They filed in around him, replacing the almond soldiers that had fallen. He didn't see Lilandra. He grabbed one of the witches in front of him. Forget the plan. It's all gone to hatchery. What's the biggest summon you could pull off? He said. She looked at him and said with sadness in her voice, After that... I don't think we could pull off anything impressive. Could you summon something specific? He said. What are you thinking? She replied. Lelandra stretched out her hand as she screamed. A powerful gust of wind caught the pouncing sand wolf under his chest as it leaped at the royal arm and guard. She had wanted to throw the creature. She had expected it to go flying at least a few feet. Instead, the gust stopped the creature's forward momentum and had hovered there for a second before gently landing. It seemed confused wondering why its claws and teeth were not buried in armor and flesh. It looked at Lalandra, and its eyes narrowed. The almond guard followed its gaze. Lalandra gulped. It let out some kind of snarl as it charged at her. The almond tried to stab it as it ran past him. The large dagger skidded across the sandwich's gray skin. It didn't even notice the impact, 
its eyes focused in murderous rage. She scanned her mind for a spell. She had plenty of energy left, plenty of elements to draw off of. But she also knew sandwolves were incredibly hardy to those same elements. She didn't have time. She panicked and dropped to a knee as she conjured a shield of light. It bounced off of it with a hearty impact, skidding backward. She held her breath. The spell was a beginner's one. It didn't cost much energy and was pretty efficient at absorbing blows, but she was unable to move while the spell was active. Her knee needed to be in contact with the ground. To make matters worse, the shield didn't cover her completely. Her back and shoulders were vulnerable. It stared at her through the shield. Its eyes peeled open, unblinking. Its wide, toothy mouth hung open as it flexed its claws. She briefly thought of changing the shield's color so she didn't have to see the pacing monster, and then the almond guard stabbed at it from behind. It whirled on him like a snake smacking at him with its deadly paw. He jumped back from the strike, slashing as he went. The dagger slid between the padding on its paw and it hissed in pain as it struck in fury at where the man had been standing. Lelander took that as her opening and she released a shield. She jumped up and moved her feet in a rhythmic stepping motion towards the beast as she swayed her hands. The ball of electricity that formed in her hands was probably the most perfect connection she had ever had with lightning. She let it flow through her, then out of her outstretched palm. It sparked between her and the creature, hitting the thing right behind its front leg where she assumed its heart would be. It yelled in pain, trembled, then collapsed, a smoky black cloud streaming from the charcoal flesh. The almond soldier looked at her, his dagger aimed at her, and then suddenly he was pulled down. The sandwich stood, dazed, the man's leg now in its mouth. The lander pulled on one last spell. If this didn't work, she wasn't sure what else she could do to hurt the creature. It bit down hard on the guard's leg, and the armor made a terrible rending sound as he screamed. It moved to run away as she slung the spell. The sonic vibration rippled through the air and hit the creature in its left hind leg with a satisfying crunch. It dropped the guard, and this time, it was the one that screamed. Its hind leg hung limp at the hip, dangling off it as it turned to face her snapping and snarling. She acted to cast a spell again, but the wolf went strangely quiet its eyes focused on her hands intensely. She slung the spell out again, and the wolf opened its mouth wide, letting out a low, single bark. The rippling air dissipated into nothingness. She stared at the wolf wide-eyed, unable to come to terms with what had just happened. It growled a sound that reminded her of grinding metal, then it charged at her sloppily on its three legs. She came to her senses a moment before its right paw made contact with her ribs. She tried to soften the blow with a gust of wind, but the unformed spell did little to cushion the blow. She was sent flying a dozen or so feet to her right. Landing on her ass, she skidded across the sand. A large chunk of her purple robe lay stuck in the thing's claws. Large scratches ran down her ribs. It shook the pierced cloth free while turning to her. Willandra struggled to shield herself again as it slowly sauntered over to her. It smacked the shield angrily, slashing with its large claws. She bent back on her knee, hoping to protect as much of herself as she could. It opened its mouth like a snake. It stretched its jaws over the shield, and two of its four large canine teeth hung uncomfortably close to her shoulders. She began to get pushed back, off of her knee. All she could see now was the thing's throat. She began to wonder if the shield would break as she was swallowed, or if it would break by the creature pushing her prone. Suddenly, it let go. It screamed a high-pitched roar while it backed away from her, shaking its head. The almond guard hung off it, a large dagger buried deep in the thing's eye. It shook the guard wrapped around its neck. It stepped backward as it shook. Its ruined leg gave out and it landed on its side. The guard pulled the blade out, then plunged it back into the socket viciously. It squealed, then convulsed, going still. She let the shield go and stood. The guard did the same, pulling the dagger free. He aimed it at Lelandra as he slid off the wolf's neck. As he landed on his wrecked armored leg, it gave out like the wolf's leg had, and he fell back onto the thing, his back resting on it. He tried to stand, but his leg slipped out from under him, weak and soggy. Apparently, the wolf's venom had kicked in. She watched him for a moment as his bloody dagger began to sag towards the ground, eventually falling out of his hands. She bent down to check on him, briefly thinking about curing his paralysis. It wasn't fatal, but he would stay like this until he was cured. His leg didn't look too bad either, 
though that was just based on the amount of blood that leaked from the armor. She touched the scratches on her ribs, thankful that the poison was stored in the sandwich's large canine teeth. She felt her feet lift off the ground. She found herself tumbling over the wolf's body, 